Hey everyone, welcome to the third talk in uh, today's focus on the interplays between music and sociality. I'm very happy to introduce the next speaker, Leila Adu Gilmore, who joined us last year for our online edition, where she was part of uh, discussions around a book launch uh, titled Electronic Cities. In uh, those, that talk, Leila was presenting uh, perspectives of the Ghanaian music scene. And today she's going to zoom out uh, into a more broad focus about decolonial research methods in music um, based on seminars that she teaches at NYU and the Critical Sonic Practice Lab. Um, so after the presentation, I'll come back up here to moderate the Q&A with Leila. Looking forward. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so... I'm going to talk about critical sonic practice, intersectional approaches to music technology, improvisation theory, and composition. Global electronic music shares innovations and trends throughout the African diaspora, like ripples on a lake. The shared cultural practice of music and dance, from bootleg tapes to mobile phones and the internet, trans-African cultural production is ever-changing and unrestricted by the norms of its colonized geography. Music research has tended to focus on music from European composers and music technology has furthered this position. Recorded music and the inclusive genre of electronic music, however, are rich resources for music research, especially for underrepresented cultures whose music stems from oral traditions. European colonizers and settlers used music, culture, and other forms, art forms in tandem with religion as tools of colonization focusing on the recorded music category of music technology, audio engineering and music production, invites research on music from oral traditions of the global South, as well as non-notated contemporary music, such as hip hop and dance music. Intersectionality calls for a deeper discussion, inclusive of class, gender, sexuality, disability, accessibility, economics. Are we including all music genres and music creators with the same gravitas in our music research? And if not, why not? So I just wanted to give you an overview of the talk. Sometimes I'll read stuff, sometimes I'll just say stuff. Uh, <laughs> Critical Sonic Practice Lab um, dissolves splits in music research practice and publication by investigating electronic musics that have typically been left out of the music, of music theory, composition, and music technology, so music research. Um, so we're going to look at the theoretical framework of critical sonic practice, uh, and then look at the lab and see what we do at the lab, and then also there'll be time for questions, and hopefully a little bit of a video as well. So critical sonic practice, uh, I coined this phrase after Jane Rendell's phrase, which is critical spatial practice, uh, a term which serves to describe both everyday activities and creative practices which seek to resist the dominant social order of global corporate capitalism. Critical theories aim neither to prove a hypothesis nor prescribe a particular methodology of, or solution to a problem. Instead, in a myriad of differing ways, critical theorists offer self-reflective modes of thought that seek to change the world, or at least the world in which the inequalities of market capitalism, as well as patriarchal and colonial or post-colonial interests, continue to dominate. I extend the term critical theory to include the work of later theorists, post-structuralists, post-colonialists, feminists, and others whose thinking is also self-critical and desirous of social change. Uh, and so I find this formulation really helpful because of this sort of reflexive uh, part of the practice, not, not set, but reflexive and questioning. So I expanded Jane Rendell's theory to from a spatial to a sonic one. In doing this, I wanted to examine musics that were often left out of the repertoire, but were important to people like me. So I'm just going to read a little bit from um, Continental Thought and Theory Journal, uh, a journal of intellectual freedom. You can download it. Well, you can download it for free. Critical Sonic Practice, Decolonizing Boundaries in Music Research. African-American music is one of the greatest art forms of the past century, but research on the, this music's composition is underrepresented in scholarship and education. Well, I've told you that already. Uh, 
In the Americas, during the era of slavery, African language and culture groups were separated to avoid Africans retaliating. Music, however, was more easily subverted and at times religiously converted away from the ears of the oppressor. African music, with its complex polyrhythms, improvisation, vocal harmonies, and unique timbres, was passed as noise to European invaders, and this lack of understanding persists. This lack of representation and self-representation is reflected in indigenous and local music research across the colonial and neocolonial world. For example, in the United States of America, the education system often omits indigenous musicians, such as Native American First Nations musicians, as well as influential global styles such as African American trap and drill or Latinx music such as reggaeton. Uh, as a composer theorist, my autoethnographic, that means I'm saying some stuff, <laughs> autoethnographic research centers on music producers in Accra, their process, influences, mentorship, and sites of listening that have repercussions on the study of similar black electronic music. Hence, the musical split in academic disciplines between white, black, and indigenous peoples is part of a legacy of suppressing bodies, minds, and culture, including music. The musical epistemological remnants of colonial legacies place boundaries and bar lines across art forms, processes, methodologies, and geographies. I argue that revealing ephological, local, and indigenous music innovation in music scholarship through critical sonic practice expands the project of anti-colonialism, clarifying the entirety of influences of music of the United States, Europe, and other diasporan countries. Judging music through historic European norms of notation, rather than recordings and live music, as you have at CTM, continues to marginalize music makers from oral traditions. The racial split between who we think of as composers and what types of music we research was founded in the colonial and empirical experiment. Black composers' writing gives us an entry point to the continuum of improvisation and composition, or what I began to call process. Reclassifying research in music composition, theory, and technology to include all types of process, including participatory music, Live performance and music technology radically expands music research, including that of Black and Indigenous musics of the world. Poetics and hip hop share knowledge of trans African musics where history books fail. From talking drums to slave songs, back music is a set of signs, symbols, and gestures experientially informs throughout the ages. Or as Kendrick Lamar schools, I've got royalty, got loyalty inside my DNA. Teetering on the razor's edge of the unknown, the black radical thought contained within improvised music has attracted me to improvisation scenes over the, over two, for over two decades. The music and thought, inbuilt community, ways of living, political thinking, books and albums, and living art is a way of life. Perhaps these fluidly moving forms attract dancers and poets to improvise music as well. So uh, here I'm just going to take a look at, uh, this is uh, Crispin's Matrix from practice uh, music as practice-based research. Uh, I found this an interesting rubric because just looking at, you know, splitting up scientific on one side and artistic on another, it does not work with music. It does not work with music. It does not work with music. So here's some ways that this, I just kind of looked at this little rubric and found it helpful. So you know, she has a bunch of different stuff. Uh, so for scientific research, for me, that uh, in my research methods, that includes you know, or empirical research, however you want to call it. For me, that includes interviews, transcriptions of music, like painstakingly transcribing, and then MIR with students, so music information retrieval, um, that's machine learning, and I don't do that, PhD students do that, but we collaborate together in the lab. Artistic research, so that's thinking through intersectionality, accessibility, indigenous epistemologies, so how can often thinking how do we give back to the community that we're researching rather than an extractivist approach, right? And composition, improvisation, always is this continuum and not splitting those up. For me, artistic practice can be improvised, notated, and instrumental as a recording artist, and Layla Adu, but also production, collaboration, and film, uh, with film and stuff like that. So a lot of different stuff. But for me, uh, as a practitioner, these are not split, and they're not split in my research either. But that is a, a fairly radical approach in these, in these, uh, you know, in these genre, uh, genres. In fact, it has to be said that in the UK and Australia, music as practice-based research is kind of more codified. And this book is in fact a book from the UK, but in the United States, uh, it's kind of it's still kind of split into performing arts and 
research in different ways. Um, so I did some, my initial research, it's a while ago now, uh, my dissertation research and also uh, was on uh, Apiatus and it was showing Apiatus because I was thinking, when thinking through a composer, I thought about this, a composer producer from Ghana. I'm also uh, half Ghanaian. And when I, when I talked to you before about what kinds of empirical research I did, well, I just transcribed some of, his, uh, well, a lot of his music and I found out a lot of information on the harmony that's not traditional harmony. It's not traditional harmony from uh, the global north, from New Northern European Christian harmony, but it's Ghanaian harmony. It took me a long time of researching it to figure out where that came from, but it's basically a Ghanaian harmony that has European elements. Uh, I thought they might play for you, but it didn't. <laughs> so on to the next slide. Um, so I'm calling this radical reclassification. It doesn't sound that radical, right? Like I'm just reclassifying stuff. Just, but it is because what it does is if I, you know, I teach advanced computer music composition. So I teach on Stockhausen, Pierre Schaeffer, Music Concrete. If you know this uh, early electronic music, you know this stuff. And then it continues in a, in a genre like that. This genre continues from uh, Western music composition, right? But if I include electronic music and I, I, I use the term electronic music instead of computer music, which of course this music is still made on computers, but if then I include a lot more kinds of music, right? Oops. So reclassifying re research in music composition theory and technology to include all types of process, including participatory music, live performance and music technology radically expands music research, including that of black and indigenous musics of the world. So that's from the article. Oops, I'm clicking, it's not clicking. Oh, there we go. So here's an example, looking at Ghanaian um, electronic music. So looking at the early music as high life, high life is the kind of You've probably heard of, of Ghana and High Life. It's still happening now. It started in the 1880s. Um, and it's a mixture of traditional styles and hymns and sea shanties from, uh, from colonizers, right? So it's a, it's a bunch of European and Ghanaian influences. Burger High Life happened when uh, Ghanaians moved to Hamburg in Germany and started using synthesizers and making shiny electronic music, right? And so then we get hip life. Afrobeats, and I'm sure 100 subgenres by now since, <laughs> since Afrobeats, because there's always, there's always, as you know from electronic music, there's always subgenres. That to say that I get to include these African electronic musics now when I talk about electronic music instead of computer music or music technology or something like that. Um, so the kinds of questions that I ask, sorry. are thinking about, in my early research, is thinking about the definitions of composition and improvisation of, of two Ghanaian music producers, how the definitions affected who we think of composers and improvisers, and the ways in which we analyze black music and music from the global south, as well as popular electronic styles. So that, that, that basically informed my thinking to, to create critical sonic practice and critical sonic practice lab. So we can use electronic music. Global music is a great term. Um, you guys know all about global music, so I don't need to tell you. Avoiding othering non-majority music by specifying terms. Okay, that's a weird long sentence I wrote on this slide. But what I mean is, instead of saying tonal harmony or Western harmony, what, where's the West? Or West of where? Who cares about that? Who's toned? Well, there's, tone, there's tones all over the world. So what if I position Northern European Christian harmony then I'm being specific and I'm not making an assumption that tonal harmony is Western harmony, is Northern European Christian harmony. Okay. And so to me, that's important to actually try to be really specific about terms that are majoritarian, to avoid othering non-majoritarian. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, ask me a question about it. 
uh, embodied listening. So you can read the chapter. I think they mentioned this book before. Um, but basically talking about embodied listening is music that is there for dancing and listening and not separating those two. There can be a complex music, I would argue often a more complex music, that we can dance to and listen to. And it doesn't mean it, you know, the separation of body and mind uh, I don't know when it's, that is Renaissance or whatever. <laughs> uh, doesn't you know? We don't need to do that when we talk about music. That we all know that uh, complex rhythm is an important part of, of of music and dance. It's not easy to make great dance music. Um, okay, but you can you can read about that in the, this book, which is called Electronic City. So she mentioned that. My chapter in there. Um, okay, Critical Sonic Practice Lab. So founded uh, in 2020, and uh, I'm an assistant professor of music technology at NYU Steinhardt, and, um, and I'm affiliated with the Music and Audio Research Lab, which has been really great to collaborate with students there in our programs, uh, and also IDM, Tandon School of Engineering's Integrated Design Media Program. So I go there and you know, work with, with synths in the audio lab and stuff like that on another NYU campus. NYU has 15 schools, so that's why there's all these different affiliations. And I collaborate with colleagues from Gallatin and Tish. Uh, I have a student lab manager, was previously a very famous person now, Delia Beat, if you know Delia Martinez, I'm really stoked to have had her as the first lab manager, and now Isabella Berger Weiser, another great composer student. Um, and this research basically informed uh, that I created Global Electronic Music One course, an undergraduate course. It's run for three years. It's super popular. We look at, we, we basically analyze music and we, we make music in that class. So both of those things. And so therefore, Critical Sonic Practice Lab confronts culturally embedded colonial and empirical exclusions in music research that may positively impact the real world in key areas, music education, funding and music programming so that doesn't sound like it but i am you know i do talks and stuff like that and i'm hoping that this will help somehow i'm talking at the new york music week from the new york mayor's office next week so you know whenever i talk about this stuff this theory underpins what i'm talking about um so the research projects that we're doing now uh i was going to show you some but it seems a bit tricky to share my screen so we're making a soundtrack for a VR movement theatre piece in collaboration with Polish director Kasia Pol and uh, Māori uh, singer and composer Ria Paki, engaging Māori cosmology and waiata. So hui is a Māori word for a gathering of women. And so this, this piece is a bunch of Māori deities, it's bringing in a bunch of Māori deities. It's site-specific, it was recorded in uh, immersive with immersive audio with those weird microphones with the lots of bits <laughs> and um it so in the new zealand and it's got beautiful nature sounds so my lab manager is kind of working on the ambient nature sound track and i'm working on a synth soundtrack uh which will mix immersively with uh paul Jaluso and music technology here at nyu so that's something that we're doing also we're working on George Lewis's Erkan Brahms database entry, and we're just also cataloging his work. We, I don't know if we've told George how much we're doing of that, but we, he knows we're doing it. <laughs> but we may be doing a bit more than he might think. And then, um, sorry, George Lewis is a composer, improviser, thinker, scholar, Columbia University professor, amazing um, thinker. And we're also, um, also part of a four-year research insight project with uh, the, univers the University of Social Sciences in Paris, which is ES, 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 and uh, that's funded by the French National Research Association, and Emmanuel Olivier is the PI of this whole, con whole uh, research project, looking at basically kind of processes, the kinds of things I've been speaking about, uh, electronic music process and these things. Most of them are anthropologists. I'm, a, I'm the crazy composer theorist on the team. But they're looking at four different West African countries, and I'm looking at Ghana. And right now, it's late stage research. I can't talk too much about it, but it's to do with music information, retrieval of microtonal variants in Ghanaian traditional scales. Okay. 
uh, yeah, I wanted to talk to you guys about the symposium because that's super cool. So we did a symposium really in response to the pandemic and to thinking about the loss of life, especially black and brown lives in New York City and across the world, you know, marginalized with, you know, a, you know, how the story goes. Often less access to healthcare, often environmental factors that place people in places where it's just harder to breathe. Uh, and also, I guess, also just the acknowledging the individual suffering of the pandemic, of people that couldn't get to a funeral of a loved one, that sort of thing. Uh, so I called the show Allergy. So we basically had a symposium with a bunch of people. You might recognize some of those names. The industry professionals, authors, journalists, uh, professors, artists, mostly people of color. Um, yeah, and we had a, what's the next slide? We had an after party. So we're with Tiger Paw and it was hosted by Kevin Gotkin, who's also DJ Hoogle. And it was an accessible after party. So it was really, um, everything was described, um, closed caption and basically Kevin's research is on accessible dance parties and that's part of his practice. So we had an accessible dance party, accessible to people with different abilities, disabilities. Um, and Fred Moten, the author, poet, um, did post notes. Rather than a keynote, he kind of reflected poetically on what happened afterwards. So would you now, A, be able to play some of this video, and B, tell me how much time I've got left? <laughs> because that will determine how much video we play. Composers, musicians, music creators, uh, DJs, we've got people representing all kinds of music in the room. When the pandemic hit, you know, I had to really learn how to listen differently. I'd always kind of written about music as community. Um, and so when you take the social element of performance away, that, you know, that really changes things. I think the thing that the pandemic did this year is it warped time and space. We can't let the pandemic be the nail in the coffin that convinces us that human connectivity is a bad thing. I hope that just people understand that like these connections that we have are really important. Creative music and the commercial market. How does one, how do you think about these things? It's not that it's not commercial. It's just that it's all about the commercium on the corner underneath the club. Can we remember that foaming, the market's general foment holding attractions safe from extraction when they keep coming? Did the general illness let us seize the time? To reflect and also to appreciate what it means to be in the room with people and, and creating music together. People got a chance to kind of feel how it feels to be locked in and also be able to step outside of themselves. So when these things that were so common, like police brutality, people were getting killed on camera way before that. Um, but people had no, no choice but to kind of see it. People were more invested in um, other people's lives more so than themselves for a change. so many things that have been happening during this past year there is an opportunity for disruption and new models to influence the future at the end of the day it is still the artists who are the most vulnerable I've been really inspired by the way that lots of artists are beginning to club together in different kinds of collectives it's changed all aspects of our industry, getting creative about what else can we do. COVID exposed the ecology of all the pressure points that go into both making creatively and then also authentically writing about it. The pandemic in a way has shifted the way that we look at reality in general, but as uh, critics in particular, since music is sort of our purview, um, I think that uh, 
in a way it has revealed different nuances in music. I like that people's music before COVID seems to still resonate during or it, it, it's just interesting how everyone received music at that time. It, it felt like a question that hadn't really been raised. Has the pandemic changed how you imagine what your audiences are doing with your work? I'm a strong believer in like um, music having the the power to, to to really like elevate an energy. Like I love DJing, and it 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 it's like a spiritual sort of like experience for me. <laughs> kind of techno and, and kind of house and that whole thing uh, all the way to kind of hip hop and more recently kind of dance hall, deconstructed dance hall. As much as nightlife has often been a refuge for marginalized communities and, and a sort of space to like to be like this enactment of this better society that we would like to imagine at large, I also do not believe that nightlife is completely inextricable from the social conditions that affect us at large around it. And so because of that, it's, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Nightlife and clubs don't exist in a social vacuum. And as such, the sort of potential for night nightlife or club life to lead the way of this like massive social change, I do think is somewhat sort of limited or maybe not limited, but is really tethered to the work that we do outside of the club to improve social conditions and reimagine systems of harm and systems of healing as it translates into the nightlife space. <laughs> shift inequities in music unless you take a very very deliberate and proactive approach to investing in the people that have been marginalized so that we can actually move the needle and get to a position where at some point it's normalized and things feel balanced once you start to create an inclusive space for one group so in this case it was women um people who have other um characteristics that have marginalized them also feel that they can come into that space. You know, the fact is in the last three years, two or three percent of film scores amongst the top 250 films have been written by women. In terms of representation, I think I have noticed like when I have a, a, a woman writing about my music or when I have somebody who's also a person of color writing about my music, they understand and catch things and ask questions in a different way uh, because of their own experiences. I think if you have more diverse voices and also if you support those those voices and also give them technical mentorship and so on, there's more opportunity and more willingness for people to be able to write about certain kinds of music and to write about it really well. Getting different perspectives from outside is really important. The music journalists will always have a point because it, it, it provides context and it, as much as artists build scenes, journalism does as well. I'm used to getting on a plane whenever I possibly can and flying around if I can, because that's for me a way of learning about the world and ex uh, experiencing difference and engaging with difference. And I did, haven't been on a plane in a year. For showing that. So yeah, we basically that symposium ran uh, for many, many hours and we talked about interfacing African electronic music. Uh, and you know, that was really, really, really interesting. We also talked about making creative music. So you would have heard some of that um, with, you know, Vijay Iyer and Microville and stuff like that. We talked about the future of club music and also just basically thinking about how uh, we can share knowledge and with music, press and writing, and also gain access to to venues and funding. So really, I guess part of this idea of uh, indigenous epistemologies, um, there's a book and I'm blanking on the title right now, but uh, it's 
it's basically asking, what are you really doing for us as a community? That's, you know, Indigenous studies, we really ask, what are you doing for us as a community? And so bringing that to every kind of research, even the symposium. So I could have maybe just asked a bunch of academics, which would be easy in some ways, but asking people in industry, asking people in press means that the people that are watching it, and it was a free symposium, it meant that, you know, those people would be able to hear like, hey, here's how I can respond to getting funding now, or, or maybe a lot of people talk in, in the funding uh, part of the discussion talked about different ways of grassroots, you know, a organizing for musicians and that kind of stuff, um, which is actually the title of the book chapter I mentioned in Ghana, so my research in Ghana. So I think, I guess one of the things that would be a take home in this talk would be thinking what you can do for the community that you are researching, especially if you're not from that community. I'm Ghanaian and I study Ghanaian music, but I grew up in New Zealand with a very different set of circumstances. So although I feel like I kind of have ear to the ground, uh, that's very different than growing up in Ghana. So, oops, I don't see my slides anymore. Could you show my slides again, please? Kind technical people. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm about to take come back. Yeah, oh, thanks. So, uh, one of the other things is more this more traditional research that I've been doing. So I'll go from the bottom up actually, because that's the chronological order. I've speak I've spoken about the continuum between improvisation and composition. To me, as a composer and improviser, this is kind of a no brainer. But believe me, this is a big academic field, and and people don't some people don't agree with it. So, uh. I write, oopsie, I write about that in, uh, I talked about that at URCAM, you can check that out on the URCAM website, pretty easy to find. Also, studio improv, improv as compositional process through case studies of music production of, and, uh, and hip life and Afrobeat. So that's in critical studies and improvisation. I also wrote a little book section in seated composition, the music technology cookbook. That's actually a music education um, book. So any of you guys out there who are music educators, and looking for exercises, it really goes right through age groups, um, and it's lots of little exercises that's edited by Adam Patrick Bell. And Adam Patrick Bell and I are also co-editing the Journal of Popular Music Education's Music Technology Issue. Uh, I wrote a bit on one of my favorite musicians, Pianos, Toys, Music and Noise, Conversations with Steve Beresford. That's a very, very tiny part, but just big ups to Steve Beresford, improviser from England. Uh, they mentioned embodied listening, grassroots governments in electronic music venues in Accra in the book Electronic Cities, Music Policies in Space in the 21st Century. I read you a tiny bit from this, my latest article from just the end of last year, Critical Sonic Practice, Decolonizing Boundaries in Music Research. That's in the Journal of Continental Thought and Theory, Special Issue, Thinking, Music, Praxis and Aesthetic. So basically in the lab we research, and research really means creation and analysis. We share knowledge through talks, uh, symposium, uh, and publishing. And, you know, what else do we do? And we, yeah, we do this kind of cutting edge research with music information retrieval. So that's all collaborating with students, so student collaborators. Yeah. And also postdocs. So I think I've ended a little early for me, but probably good timing for the festival because, you, <laughs> because we started it late. So I really like to answer questions. So if anyone, I realize it's quite echoey in there, sorry, but feel free to ask me a question. Thank you, Leila. Thanks. Um, so far, online viewers are silent, so maybe there's a question to start from the audience here. 
uh, I, I can ask a question first. <laughs> then, um, going back to your one of the takeaway messages that you mentioned about uh, when you're doing work to always think about giving something back to the community, um, would you have any suggestions or maybe an example from your own uh, research with uh, music in Ghana of um, how you've done that? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I really feel with the lab and the symposium that that's the case, but um, you know, early on, basically I started formulating critical sonic practice and this, and understanding indigenous studies a bit, you know, in the last, I don't know, five years, but I started my research in Ghana earlier than that. So though, you know, we, I would, you know, as a student, take people up for dinner and things like that, there's things that you can do that are kind of cool. I think there's a lot more to be done with sharing the knowledge and, you know, that's more what I'm thinking now. So basically there's sort of things that traditionally researchers would do, but I feel like the symposium is the best example of that, of thinking, hey, you're in a pandemic and musicians don't have any money. It's all very well just talking about this stuff, but let's try and make a symposium that just talks to musicians about how to get press, how to, you know, how to get money, how to convene in different ways in this time when musicians are sort of stuck at home in New York anyway, and it's different all over the all over the world, sorry, the country, but the world. But the time we were locked down and musicians were really hurting. So I think in that, you know, in that instance, it, it worked. But it is a bit harder in the global south. I mean, some of it's just purely technical is that a lot of the people that I'm working with don't have so much access to technology, like don't have concepts. Uh, constant access to the internet and stuff. So I guess paying participants where you can, giving them gear where you can, those kinds of things. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Okay, online is silent as well. Um, well Leila, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us and for sharing thanks, your thanks knowledge. Thanks for having me. I hope you have a great time. I wish I was there. <laughs> Next time. Yeah, hopefully next time. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, right. Ah, there is one question. Ah, good, good. We're warming up. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, it always takes someone else to warm it up. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much for your talk. It was uh, it was fascinating. I think the work you're doing is incredibly valuable. Um, as uh, as a, a, a lecturer, I teach at, at BIM in, in Bristol in the UK um, on uh, electronic music production course um, and um, still you know as, as you'll, you'll know very well the, the sort of histories of, of electronic music are you know so overwhelmingly dominated by white western men um, and uh, you know I, I feel like you know of course that needs that needs to, to change and, and universities are one of the places that it needs to change because we're educating the younger generation in those uh, in those histories um, and it's it's challenging because um, the uh, you know important artists um, who are not white Western men uh, have been written out of the histories so you need to do a lot of digging to to, to find their work but then I find myself um, also quite conflicted sometimes um, uh, partly as a white western man myself and and uh, thinking you know is it is it my place to be uh, to be talking about these the musics from uh, from other cultures uh, and partly because the students that I teach are mainly white western men um, and I think what well, is there a risk of you know, if they're taking influence from the music of these other cultures of cultural appropriation, and I wondered if you, if you found that that issue of cultural appropriation to be problematic um, in the work that, that you've done with with students or with people mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot in there. One, it was from Bristol, which I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, Bristol's kind of king. So you guys got you got an advantage on 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 the next thing I'm gonna say. Cultural appropriation is something often, as a black woman, people ask me about all the time. I'm often a bit scared to say on camera, and so here I am. I even wrote a step, a step guide in my, I'll tell you my guide if you want. I wrote a guide because people always ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, because I thought about it, 
I don't think it's too. No, let's see if it's. It's like my four step guide. Four, I hope I still have it. Oh, here it is. It's text. As a person of colour, people ask my opinion about appropriation. I've made this helpful three-step guide so that I never need to answer that question again. Uh, this was on Facebook because there was a lot of talk about the time. Layla's three-step guide to appropriation. <laughs> Making art, music, dance, or otherwise, that resembles another culture and wondering if it's cultural appropriation. One. Who is getting credit for the work? Two, who is making the money, i.e. fee, royalties, or copyright in case of sale? Three, whose culture, if any, has colonized the other culture? Whose culture, if any, has colonized the other culture? If the answer to one or more of these questions is me, mine, or 100%, then you might be culturally appropriating, so consider the following. Research that culture to see if your use of the art form in question is offensive or unacceptable in the context that you're about to use it. If so, don't do it. If your research shows that it's acceptable for you to use the artwork, art form, for your own purposes, great. Always credit the original art form, and if you can locate the artist, pay them. So that's why I'm saying you've got an advantage being from Bristol, because you do know the culture. So like if I go to Bristol, I might do something, you know, appropriate. In fact, I think I have. I've made a lot of music that sounds a bit like trip hop. So, um, for instance, I might take from Ghanaian influences or Balinese influences. So I, I played in Gamelan for seven years. I learned Indonesian. I can't speak Indonesian now, but I really could. And I went to, to study and I knew the kinds of music that it's okay that, that Balinese people do change music. We've got contemporary Balinese composers. They collaborate. So, you know, but can you, you can't step over an instrument that's sacred. You can't like step over it. So, you, you know what I mean? Like, it, I think just sort of, bland, you know, boldly going into another culture and just kind of ripping stuff, that's not cool. But uh, learning about it is really, 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 really important. So, I think the work of majoritarian people, white people, men, whoever's majoritarian in the case, it may not be those people I just mentioned could be somebody else uh, but I think that it's really important to to analyze understand teach and if you're an enthusiastic you should teach the culture I mean if I was a history teacher would I have to be Chinese to teach about Chinese history no I just have to be on my game and I think that's the case like I guess what of what a lot of what I've been saying um, which kind of feels like harping on a bit but Missing out this history hurts people now, and that's the under, like that's, if there's a personal goal that I have and that drives me, I think that uh, the lies that have been told about cultures, as in this kind of primitive idea that's such crap, hurts people now. It kills people now. It gets people shot now. It's not a small thing. So filling out cultural history and like understanding that math comes from Egypt or whatever it is, you know, an astrophysicist that was saying that he didn't realize that there's this early algorithms are actually from Egypt, pre-Greek, and that like Pythagoras went hung out in Egypt and learned it, and then we came back and they were like, oh, we just went and went on a mystical trip. So those things hurt black kids who were like, I, like young black men, he was saying, young black men in the United States who are like, uh, oh, I can't do math. So these things are really important. Black people cannot be the only people to do the work because often they're not positioned to. I feel like I'm a bridge, right? Like I'm positioned to, I'm a New Zealander, I'm Ghanaian, no one knows what the hell's going on. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's important to do that work. And I get students kind of asking me similar questions that like you were saying, like, that maybe they ask you, like, is it appropriate? Or like, why am I teaching white guys? And it's like, no, look, this is the real history of music. If you teach it otherwise, you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you have to teach the correct history and people haven't been doing that they've been teaching a really weird history that's only known to a very few people I learned it, I learned acoustic music I've studied music at university for 10 years at Princeton and in New Zealand so I, you know, I know but I, it's, a, it's just a slither of history and I think most to be, to be fair to most composers professors, we know that, it's just that you know colonialism 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there's another question. Hi, um, thanks, Lila. Um, yeah, first of all, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, really fascinating presentation. But um, uh, my question was just about your very elegant three-step guide, whether this is something that's available as an online resource. No, it's something I used to say on Facebook, whatever. No, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't like to ever get pinned down. That's partly why I made a lab and I research and stuff and I talk about discussion and no frozen thing. As soon as you say something, it's wrong next week and it should be wrong. Angela Davis gets asked about like, should we call people people of color now? She's like, yeah, things change. Things change. So, but I guess cultural sensitivity, right? You know, sometimes it just helps to be positive rather than negative, right? So like, Instead of appropriating, think about cultural sensitivity and talk about it. You know, I think that's part of really, it's really what it is. It's cultural sensitivity. And uh, talking, I mean, honestly, just finding people from the culture that you're working with. Well, I mean, if you're not talking about ancient Mesopotamia, I don't know, somebody from that. But often the music, the cool thing about the music I'm working with is I can go ask people who are alive. That's what's so cool about studying electronic music. So you can talk to people who are involved in the scene and say like, hey, do you think this is all right? I mean, I think that's honestly the, always the best thing to do, whether you're working in the global south or the global north, is to talk to people. Because I can't tell anyone what they should do. But a person in that community, if you're too, you know. So I, I would say there's these two things. I think I was trying to say that to the last man's great question too, which on one hand, when you're creating, when you could be appropriating, you really need to engage cultural sensitivity and communication. I could be wrong, but I think when it comes to researching music, it's open slaving out. I could be wrong, and I know people that don't agree with me publicly, <laughs> so don't think that that's true. But I do think, you know, studying these musics is correct to do. It's correct to do, it's correct to teach, and they're not enough. And no, no matter what people think about hiring practices, there are not enough black, brown, indigenous people, not enough BIPOC people to teach this stuff in time. In time for like, you know, whatever's happening next. These practices are helpful. Music is helpful to the planet. Improvisation, participation, dance, these things are joyous, you know? And um, yeah, I think that they're really, really helpful. So we should, we should engage in these practices, but really understand them with cultural sensitivity and not just sort of take a sample and listen and be like, oh yeah, I don't know, that kind of Moby approach, I don't know, you know, that, that could be, some of that stuff could be harmful, I imagine, to some people. Yeah, I think, I think that's really helpful to think about it that way, as a, as a dynamic, changing thing and not this, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I just think being, talking, discussion, a lot of the problems now are like shutting, you know, what, cancelling, shutting down discussion, that doesn't help. We need to talk about these things. Thank you. It's still time for one last question. Okay, great. Well, Leila, thanks again very much. Thank you. Thanks for this great question. I really do like answer questions. But I told you my three six guide. I never said that publicly before. So you go. You go. That was a special extra. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me and giving me time and to talk about the lab. My lab is a critical sonic practice lab. It's like WP, NYU, WordPress, NYU. Just look up critical sonic practice lab, NYU, and you can contact us and see the work that we're doing. Okay, thanks a lot. So um, we'll start the next talk in about 20 minutes. So please come back. Thanks.